Amen and amen. You may be seated. Give the Lord a clap, praise. This morning, what an incredible time. Hey, an incredible time of worship with an incredible selection of music. Amen. Come on, I don't know if y'all noticed. Somebody getting it, yeah. Somebody getting it. Most of them were written back in the 16 and 1700s. But I want you to know God's still inspiring songwriters even into 2019s. Amen. So all kind of music. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, we're going to look at chapter 16, verses 19 through 31 this morning. The book of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, as we continue on in our sermon series entitled Re 66. Ladies and gentlemen, we are traveling through the Bible. And as we preach the Bible from cover to cover, as we teach the Bible from cover to cover, as we read together the Bible from cover to cover, we're unfolding the unparalleled, unprecedented truths of the Word of God, allowing them to permeate who we are and move on us and change us from the inside out. Just like that old Route 66, a care person from east to west, we're traveling Reed 66, and we're not going east to west. Look at me, ladies and gentlemen. We're moving from them unto life. I said them unto life. Luke chapter 16 this morning, verses 19 through 31, as we give thought to a sermon that I've entitled, Facts and Our Future. Facts and Our Future. Could I add to it if you want to put on your title page? Facts and Our Future, part one. Part one. One, fact, and our future. While you're turning to Luke chapter 16, you know, we are infatuated. We are enthralled with the future. Have you ever noticed that? How, how we really, we, we just get, I, I, I mean, we're just compelled somehow, some way to figure out the future. I mean, we just, and sometimes it leads us to unhealthy ways, but I mean, you know, I mean, we just get caught up in trying to figure out the future, don't we? I mean, I've seen you over at the Itchy Bond, and I know when you get to fortune cookies. I've seen it over there. So, I mean, we just get to, I mean, but we're looking for any way we can to get a leg up on the future. Amen. I mean, sometimes it leads us to unhealthy ways. Sometimes it moves way beyond itchy bond, okay? And it, move, and it moves into the horoscopes or it moves maybe even into that uh, very evil and, and very unhealthy for your life, those, those psychics and those spiritualists and those mediums, those palm readers and all of that, all of that jazz. And, and I want you to understand the reason why I say it's dangerous and unhealthy for you because honestly, if you want to know the future, mm, if you really want to know the future, then you can. You can go to these. And if they're a true psychic or a medium or a spiritualist, they're endowed, okay, and possessed with a python spirit. And that python spirit literally can, can unfold for them to unfold for you the future. So you can, if you find the right one, all right, and, not, and they're never free, but if you find the right one, you can really unfold the future. This is what Paul dealt with over in Acts chapter 16, what got him thrown in prison. Remember that woman who was following? She was possessed with the python spirit, and she was unfolding the future for all the businessmen in town. It became pretty lucrative for them. And when Paul cast out the demon and she couldn't tell the future, they didn't like it very much. But listen, I mean, it leads us. My point is that it often leads us into an unhealthy paradigm in trying to figure out the future. This is what I want you to know. This is exactly why the Lord said, leave all that junk behind. This is why he said in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31, do not consult mediums and spiritualists. You know what he really said? If you really want to boil that down to the, uh, to the basic Hebrew in Leviticus 19, 31, leave all that junk alone. Now, what he said. Don't mess with it because, listen, when you do that, you're getting your future from the enemy. He'll tell you what your future is, but God don't want you to consult the enemy. God wants you to check in with him. 
and he, he wants us to live a life of faith, and he gives us just enough of our future. This is one I, I want you to understand. You don't have to go to unhealthy means. Listen, the greatest place that you can find uh, any aspect of your future, if you want to know the future, what God wants you to know about the future is all contained in the infallible, inerrant, inspired Word of God. And there it's chock full of some great tidbits, some interesting tidbits about the future of mankind and the future of your life and especially eternal life. I mean, it's interesting how God unfolds it, but he gives us just enough to understand what he wants us to understand. It's so awesome to dive in and see what God has for the future. You know, that's really what we're going to do as we look not only this week, but we're going to look in two weeks from today, 14 days from, to now, uh, from, from today, from now. I, I'm going to unfold in two parts, really in this sermon entitled, all right, uh, Facts in Our Future. I'm going to unfold how the future unfolds for, listen, in two ways. For those who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you what the future holds for you, Amen. And those who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm going to unfold for you what the future holds. That just happens to be the topic of discussion for today. So as we look at Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, I want you to understand that we're trying to parallel. And as we continue our quest from the lectern to the pulpit and the pulpit to the lectern, when you went to Sunday school this morning, your Sunday school teacher gave you a lesson based on the crucifixion, uh, the death that ultimately led to the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel, which Paul says in Romans 1, 16, is the power of God for salvation. It's the gospel that saves, right? But as your Sunday school teacher expounded on what we've already explored through the Easter season in my sermon series, Sunrise. So today what I want to do is take the Sunday school lesson and really and, and really transport it, if you will, trans, trans, move it forward, if you will, all the way to the future of our eternal lives. And Again, I'm going to share, and, to, to, and this is why I'm going to invite you, even today, and you're going to see some things come out about it. We'll talk about it Wednesday night in our summer preview, but nevertheless, this is why I'm going to invite you uh, and to ask you to invite some guests on May 19th special guest and particular guest and I'm going to have a great gift for them for coming, a little token of our appreciation, all of this to help you get them here because in that I'm going to share with them what a future with Jesus looks like ladies and gentlemen and I hope they grab hold of it but today I'm going to remind us what a future without Jesus looks like as we look at Luke chapter 16 beginning in verse 19 going down to verse 31. Stand if you would as we read together Luke chapter 16. Here's what I want us to understand today. As we look at this passage of Scripture, I'm going to give you seven facts of the future. Here's the reality, and don't miss this. I'm going to make it very plain. I'm going to make it very simple to understand. I'm not going to flower it up with flowery language. I want you to hear me and hear me loud and clear. The future of a person who rejects the Lord Jesus Christ, the future of a person who rejects the gospel and the provision that God has made through what you've already learned about in Sunday school today, through the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. When a person rejects that, they spend eternity in a place called hell. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus, I want you to be very attentive to what I preach today from the pages of the Word of God. And I want you to understand what the future holds if and when a person rejects Jesus Christ and the provision of the gospel. And through that, I'm really going to give you seven facts of the place. And today, as we look at this, I'm going to give you seven 
facts indicative or regarding the place called hell. Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. <clears throat> Now, this is a story that Jesus himself is telling. And he says, Now, there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man by the name of Lazarus was laid at his gate. Lazarus <clears throat> was covered with swords, uh, sores and longing and was laid at his gate, okay, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his soul. God had to send dogs to do what the man would not do. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and he was buried. And verse 23 says, where he was spending eternity. The Bible says, in Hades, in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Would you send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue? For I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, no. No, we, we, now we're not going to do anything like that. No, young man, you had your opportunity on this side of eternity to make a choice of where you wanted to spend eternity. Nope, we're not going to bring any water. We're not going to bring a gallon of water. We're not going to bring a jug of water. We're not going to bring a drop of water. Remember, child, during your life you received some great things. And likewise, Lazarus, bad things. But now it's all over. Life is done. And now the only thing that matters is the choice you made for eternity. So therefore, Lazarus is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, there's a great gulf fix, a great chasm fix. And those who wish to come over here to you will not be able to. And that none of you that are down in hell may cross over into heaven. There'll be no escape. There'll be no way out. There'll be no temporary relief. And the rich man said, Then I beg you, Father. I like the King James verse that I pray thee, Father. <laughs> I beg you, Father, that you would send Lazarus to my father's house because I've got five brothers and I want him to warn them because they're on their way to hell too. Lazarus said, I mean, Abraham said, no, no, we're not going to do any of that now. No, they got Moses and the prophets. In other words, they got the word of God and a preacher to explain it. They got everything they need to make an informed decision on this side of eternity. Besides, even if I sent Lazarus back, even if I sent somebody from the dead, if they won't believe the word of God, they're not going to believe that either. Father, let it be a great reminder today of the eternal consequence and the fact of our future if we reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If there be anyone here that's never accepted him, let them not reject today because they've been told the truth and let the truth set them free. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You may be seated.
Seven facts of our future. I've got to hasten on to get done with this sermon. Seven facts. The first fact of our future, indicative of those who reject Jesus Christ, we know that they go to hell. And the first fact regarding hell is the fact that hell, look at me, is a place of authentication. It is a place of authentication. Look at verse 19. The Bible says there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man by the name of Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered up with sores, and longing just to be fed with the crumbs that were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, he was so poor, he was so feeble, he couldn't afford any medical care, he was in such bad shape, nobody would take care of him, and God had to send the dogs to do what mankind would not do. The only medicine that was available to him because of his poor condition, his economic condition, his outcast condition, was the dog, was the saliva from a dog. Hell is a place of authentication. Now, li listen to me. I want you to walk with me, and you got to listen quick because I've got a lot to preach, all right? But here's, here's what I want you to understand. This is, a, this is a story that Jesus is telling. Now, it's not a parable, okay? I want you to understand the difference between a, a story, this story and what Jesus is, and then all the other parables that Jesus told. A parable would be a fictitious story that's, that's used for illustrative purposes. And here, uh, th this is not a story. I believe this is an eyewitness account from the Son of God himself, indicative of two men that made, and, and based on their choices on this side of eternity, how that played out on the other side. When they closed their eyes, and then they opened it on the other, opened them on the other side of eternity. So Jesus is telling a story about what happened to two men. First, a rich man. The Bible says he was very rich. He was he habitually dressed in purple in fine linen. You know what that means? He had some fine threads. Come on. I mean, he, he had some fine. I mean, he didn't just dress up for church. Come on. He dressed up every day with some fine. He was a sharp-dressed man, enough to make ZZ Top proud. <laughs> I mean to tell you, I mean, he looked good. I mean, he probably even got his suits down there at the belt. Can I get a witness? I mean, this man. And the reason why he dressed like that is because he could. His dress code was indicative of his lifestyle. This man was filthy rich. He had everything that the world had to offer in terms of lucrative means and economic stability. If he was in this day and time, I mean, if he was in our era, if he was an American at any time in American history, his last name might have been Rockefeller. His last name might have been Carnegie or even Vanderbilt. I mean, to tell you he had some money. Now we know, I've already read the story, and, and you know that the rich man went to hell. I want to go ahead and clear up any confusion now. He did not go to hell because he was rich. Come on. He went to hell because of his spiritual condition and the choice that he made on this side of eternity. Your economic, your socioeconomic condition has no bearing on, on your eternal destination. Are you with me? I've told you time and time again, ain't nothing wrong with having a little money. Ain't nothing wrong with having a few items of stuff. The problem is when that little money and that stuff has you, can I get a witness? Oh, come on, let me get down here and tell y'all that again, because that was a good word. There's nothing wrong with having a little bit of money. There's nothing wrong with not having money. It's really, it's nothing wrong with having a little money. The problem is when the money's got you. That's exactly what's the matter with this man. He never heeded the words of Matthew 6, 24, when they had to chew, when Jesus said, you, got, you can't have two masters. You can either serve God or serve money. You can't do both. 
Every one of us got to make a choice. I mean, we can go after everything the world has to offer and live like the world. I mean, go out here and make all you can, can all you make, and sit on the can. You can do that if you want to. Well, listen, it's that time it'll get you. It'll get you, won't it? Suck you in, don't think it won't. That's what happened to this man right here. The Bible says he was rich. Filthy rich. Guess what happened to him? He died. Guess what he took with him? Nothing. Only his spiritual condition. Let that be a word of warning to you. They're not going to follow that hearse with a U-Haul and put your stuff in the casket. You're not going to take it with you, son. And listen, if you die before your wife, I promise you this, she may send it with you. She's going to write you a check and put it in the casket. <laughs> Let you cash it when you get there. That wasn't in my notes, but that was good. <laughs> he was a rich man. And then the Bible transitions and tells us about a poor man, a poor man by the name of Lazarus. This is how you know this is a story and not a parable, because in parables, Jesus never used people's names. But here he uses the name of the poor man, Lazarus. You say, well, what about the rich man? I kind of agree with Diedrich Bonhoeffer. The reason why he didn't call the rich man's name because he did not know it. It was not written in the book. Whew. Y'all about to preach me to death today. There's a poor man by the name of Lazarus. And he was so poor, so destitute, so down and out, he couldn't get no help and he couldn't help himself. And sometimes, now listen, we get down on people oftentimes, but there's some people need a hand up and there's some people need a hand out. And some people don't need a hand out, they just need a hand up. And some people need a hand out, though. It's our responsibility to pray and seek how God would serve the socioeconomic needs of our nation and people. But that's not what the rich man did. Somebody, at least somebody had enough wits about him and mercy to drop him off at the rich man, and he, all he wanted was a piece of that sandwich to fall. If he could just get some nourishment. But yet again, we would say based on this passage of Scripture, that Lazarus, unfortunately, in this earthly life, lived a life of a living hell. But my, 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 how the tides turn when it's all said and done. A poor man by the name of Lazarus. The Bible says in verse 20, Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. This would be indicative of heaven. And the rich man also died and he was buried. And the Bible says that he went to Hades. He went to hell. Now, can I remind you, I said that hell is a place of authentication. You know who authenticated it? You know who said that hell is real? I remind you that the story is not only recorded in the infallible, inerrant Word of God where Jesus said, sanctify them in your Word because the Word is the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the truth. And not only is the story found in the truth, the truth is recorded from Jesus' own mouth. You know how we know that hell is real? Because Jesus said it was. He's not a liar. And you got to make that determination today. Jesus is no liar. But to you, you got to make a determination. He's Lord or he's a liar. But I promise you, hell is a real place. You say, Pastor, I just don't know. If you don't believe it here, I promise you, you'll believe it when you got there. There's nobody in hell today that doesn't believe hell is real. It's a real place. You know why? Because Jesus said it was. 
But not only is it a place of authentication, a, a real place, the second fact of our future is the fact that those who reject Jesus, they spend eternity in hell, and hell is a place of anguish. The Bible says in verse 23, in Hades, this rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Look at me and make no never mind about it. Hell is not a place that anybody wants to go. I want you to understand sometimes we get out here and all the foolishness, uh, glib glab of our mouth and we're just getting the diarrhea and the vomiting of the mouth and get out here and say, well, we'll just all go to hell. And when we get down to hell, we'll just throw a party and we'll just have a big party in hell. There ain't no parties in hell. The only place in eternity they throw in parties is in heaven. And just like Luke chapter 15 said, that the presence of the angels rejoice when one sinner comes home. The only place they party is when people get saved and escape the fiery flames of hell. But I promise you this, there is no partying in hell. The Bible says that hell is a place of torment. It's a place of eternal damnation. It's a place of eternal punishment where Jesus said in Matthew 13, 42, it's a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Mark chapter 9, verse 48, it's a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched. Third fact of our future without a relationship with Jesus and we spend eternity in hell. The third fact of hell is not only is hell a place uh, of and authentication and a place of anguish, but hell is a place of awareness. Look at verse 23. In Haiti, the rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and he saw Abraham afar away and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, have you ever read this? Have you ever thought about what this says? Have you ever thought about what this means for all eternity? Jesus tells us that the rich, mm, the rich man died and he lifted up his eyes, being in toy. In Hades, he li you know what that means? He was conscious. See, oftentimes we get this idea about eternity, especially if we miss heaven, you know, I mean, and go to hell like somehow, like, like one day it's all going to be over. Eternity, hey, hey, eternity is forever. And nobody escapes death and nobody escapes eternity. You're going to spend, everybody going to die, and then the judgment. Isn't that what Hebrews now? And then based on the judgment, that judgment's based on your relationship or your rejection of Jesus Christ, and it determines where you spend eternity forever. And it never dies. The only time we experience death is in this physical life. But once this baby is over, we go forever wherever we are. It's a place of consciousness. He lifted up his eyes. He was awake. And give what he saw. The man was there, saw Abraham and Lazarus. Now, he wouldn't have known Abraham. He wouldn't have recognized him, but he sure would have recognized Lazarus, wouldn't he? Now, think about that. You know what Jesus is telling us? For all eternity in hell, hell is not only a place of consciousness, because you're never going to die in heaven or hell. You're never going to die again, right? That's only in this physical life. Get this. Get it. It's a place of consciousness and memory. He remembered. He, well, there's the old Lazarus. The same one, same one. I walked by day after day when he was asking me for a crumb from my table and I told him to go get a job. That's the same one that just wanted to take what I'd worked so hard in my life to build up. He just wanted what I, what I had done for myself. How dare him ask me for a little help? Why don't he just get a job? 
I'll tell you what I'll do. Next time he asks me for some food, I'll give him a job application. If you hadn't picked up, this is some of the dumb stuff we do with those who need help. This is some of the, this is some of the ignorant stuff we say. When we pass by, Again, I'm not saying everybody needs a hand. It's your, it's your responsibility to pray and ask the Lord what he would have you do with your resources in regard to somebody else. And don't just, don't just, do, you pray about it. But if God tells you to give them money, I don't care what they spend that money on. Let them go buy some beer at the store. That's on them, not you. It's ignorant. Who placed the consciousness and memory? He remembered old Lazarus that he walked by every day, didn't he? There he was. There he was, old Lazarus. And he remembered him. You know what hell is? It's a place of consciousness. You're going to be wide awake down there. And while you're burning in the fiery flame, be wide awake. And then remembering. You remember everything about this life. And every opportunity you had to serve God, every opportunity you had to accept God. As a matter of fact, if you're in this place today and you reject Jesus, you don't get saved at the invitation, guess what? You'll forever remember May 5th, 2019, when the preacher said, you don't have to go, but Jesus is the only way. Oh, you remember that? You remember me and for all eternity. If that's not enough to motivate you to get saved, I don't know what to <laughs> I mean, hell bad enough, and then they had to think about me all the time. <laughs> hell. It's a place of consciousness and memory. It's a place of awareness. But fourth fact of our future is the fact that those who reject Jesus Christ spend eternity in hell, and hell is a place of agony. And the Bible says that he cried out and said, here's the rich man, he cried out and said, Father Abraham, can I stop right here and tell you something? And I want you to get this, and I want you to get this good. Look at me and listen. I want you to look at me and listen, because right here, we begin to know and understand. This is not just no ordinary, greedy, selfish, rich man. This is a religious man. Are you listening? He said, Father Abraham, indicative of his religiousosity, his religiousness in his life, because he knew Abraham. He might not have recognized it, but when he came to understand who Abraham was, he gave him his rightful greeting as Father Abraham, Father of the Jews. You know why he said that? Because he was a Jew. He was religious. Oh, son, he had it all together. But you know what this tells us today? You understand what this tells us today? Religiousness will not keep you out of hell. <laughs> Religious osity, if you want to put some fancy terminology. Religion won't keep you out of hell. I don't care how many vacation Bible schools you've been to. I don't care how many vacation Bible schools you served in. I don't care how many times you've been in that, dunked in that precious uh, pool up there. I don't care. Listen, I don't care how many songs you know. I don't care if you knew every song in the worship set today without even looking at the screen. And we had some good songs today. Can I get a witness? I'm still on that. I can't get off of it, you know. Because you know, every now and then we'll throw in one of these from the white book. Most time we're singing them 7-Elevens. You know, where you sing the same words over and over 11 times, you know. <laughs> Just over and over. I like them, though. I do. I like them. But son, I get fired up on these. When we get back, when we can get back in the yesteryear on the songs, I don't care how many songs you know in that book. 
I don't care how many crackers you've eaten in communion. I don't care how many times you've been in the box in confession. I want you to know the only way that you can escape the fiery flames of hell is to have your sins absolved. Can't no priest absolve your sin. Can't no preacher absolve your sin. The only one who can absolve your sin is the only one who can absorb your sin in the blood that flowed from his veins. Religion won't keep you out of hell, and it won't get you in heaven. It's only the righteousness that comes from Jesus. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we could become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It's only the righteousness of God. I bet this man was surprised, don't you? I bet this man, this religious man who'd done all the things, I mean, he probably went to church, and he, he might have even went on Wednesday. I mean, he'd been to church, and all of a sudden he got the, 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 the debt. Hebrews 9, 27, pointed on the man wants to die, and then all of a sudden the judgment came, and he found himself in hell, and I bet he was surprised. And I bet he did what many of the church members are going to do. What many of our church members are going to do. What many of the church members that occupy the roles of the Southern Baptist Convention, the Methodist, and the Episcopal Convention, I mean, whatever, the church roles, I want you to understand that I bet he was as surprised as they're going to be the day that they close their eyes on this side of eternity and wake up and they're in hell. You know why they're in hell? Because they never got saved. Oh, they got religion, but they never got right. And then they're going to look at the Lord and say, but Lord, 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 Matthew 7, 21, but Lord, Lord, I mean, I came to church. There was a few times I even came on Wednesday night, Lord. Lord, I worked and served in the nursery. Every, every other month. Lord, I sang in the choir. I've been in the front up in the choir. Front. Jesus said, Hang on. No, I can't seem to find your name, sir. I can't seem to find your name, ma'am. Get away from me, you worker of iniquity. You did all this stuff for yourself, but you never knew me. That's exactly what happened to the rich man. Hell is a place of agony. He cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Would you just send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off in my tongue? For I'm in agony. And have y'all ever been hot? Hey, have y'all ever been hot? I mean, we're getting close to the hot season. You know what I'm saying? Cause, and and you, know it's, you know it's getting close because, you know, for about half the winter, I hear from y'all, boy, I can't wait till we can wear our short sleeves and put our shorts on. And then about half the summer, I can't, well, boy, I wish it'd cool off a little bit. Y'all know how you do. Never satisfied. <clears throat> but have y'all ever been hot? I remember last summer, I got hot. And it takes a lot because about 100 degrees and 100% humidity, that's right up my alley. You, you, you catching my drill? 
But I mean, I, I remember it was hot. We was working on that house over in Greenbrier, you know, and, and really the jump start to that Christmas in July that we're going to be doing this year that I'm going to tell you about Wednesday night when we build a house and just give it away for free. Amen? Because that's what the Lord told us to do. That's how we impact the people's socioeconomic status. But look at me. I'll tell you more about that Wednesday night. I can't wait. Can't wait. All right, but... I mean, that jump started, right? In Operation James 222, Green Brown. I remember we was down there, and son, it was hot. I mean, it got hot. I remember when I, uh, in, in one particular day, in the 88-hour time frame to which we built this house, so, I mean, we didn't have no time to rent. We just had to get some refreshment when we could, and it got hot, and I got to thinking, boy, I need some water. Oh, I need some water. I mean, I was already chafed up from bottom up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was rough out there, wasn't it, Wallace? So I had to get, I had to get some water. I remember drinking that water, which seemed, was seemingly like a never-ending supply. I mean, there was plenty in there. If I wanted as much as I wanted, and I kept drinking, I was thinking, boy, what refreshment to my body. What, how good this is to have this abundance of water to drink on this very hot occasion. But you you know what I've done? I've never been hot and thought to myself, boy, if I could just get me a drop of water on the end of my tongue. Have you ever imagined how hot hell is where a drop of water would be satisfying? How satisfying would it have been to you out there working on that house if somebody just put a spot of water? Hey, I brought you something to drink. <laughs> but in hell, they would love for that because they're in agony in this flame, and the flame never dies. There's no satisfaction in hell. You know what he said? Abraham, would you, would you send Lazarus and just let him bring a drop of water? You know what Abraham said? No. <laughs> Son, we can't do that. Now, come on. Now, in your life, you have plenty of water, and you have plenty of time. But we not, that's not how it works down there, boy. We can't do that. And besides, there's a great chasm fixed over here, which brings me to another, another fact. Fifth fact of our future is the fact that those who reject Jesus Christ spend eternity in hell. And hell's not only a place of agony, it's a place of aloneness. Look at the Bible. The Bible says, but Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he's being comforted and sorry, but you're in agony. But you made the choice. And besides all this, between us there's a great chasm, a great gulf fit. So the, those who wish to come over from from where you are and from where we are, there'll be no transition. You are where you are forever. You know what that means down in hell? Sure is a lonely place. Because you're down there, and don't, don't think that there's not an abundance of people down there. Because narrow is the way that leads to heaven, and broad is the gate that leads to destruction. Don't think there's not a lot of people down there, but nobody you really want to hang out with. And not only that, you ain't got time to hang out because you're trying to find some satisfaction from the torment and eternal flame and agony that you're experiencing. Nothing like that going on in heaven now. Now that... I'll tell you more about heaven on May 19th. Sure is lonely. You know what's not going to happen in hell? You're not going to get no water, and you're not going to get no visits. Guess what's going to happen? You see mom and daddy up there that tried and tried and tried to get you to go to church with them and you just refuse and now all of a sudden and then you see across the great divide across the great chasm you see mama and mama hey mama and Abraham is son she came she not coming Mama ain't coming, daddy ain't coming, granddaddy ain't coming, grandmama ain't coming, little Susie ain't coming, little Johnny ain't coming. Ain't nobody coming to hell to visit you. 
You're on your own. It's a lonely place. But not only is it a place of aloneness, it's a place of appeal. Look at this. I didn't say it's an appealing place. I said it's a place of appeal. Look, and, 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 la and the rich man said, then I beg you, Father. The King James Version says, I pray thee, Father, that you send to my Father's house. You know what they're doing? They're making a whole lot of appeal in hell. Hell is full of prayer. Did you know that? They're praying down in hell. Now, it ain't doing no good. But they sure are praying in hell. They're praying for all kinds of things. They're praying for themselves, but it's a little too late once you make it to hell. But not only is it a place of appeal, but finally today, a seventh and final fact of our future without Jesus, a seventh and final fact of hell where we spend eternity, hell is a place of appetite. Not only is it a place of appeal, look at me, look at me, it is a place of appetite. You know what they're hungry for in hell? Hey, hey, hey! You know what they're hungry for in hell? Evangelism. Evangelism. Look what he said. Then I beg you, Father, that you would send Lazarus to my father's house, for I've got five brothers that are coming to hell if somebody doesn't warn them. I don't want them to come to this place. There's nobody in hell. You know what they're doing? They're praying for you, and they're begging that somebody, somebody will stop you from coming to hell if you've never been saved. Yeah, that's what they're doing. It's full of evangelism. There's more evangelism in hell than most of the churches that are in existence today. You know what they're doing? They're praying and begging. If somebody send to the loved one, somebody send them to the friends, because all that foolishness and playing around in life, and now they wind up in hell and they'll do anything they can, but the problem is it's too late. You know, he says, I beg you, I pray, I pray, would you send, would you send Lazarus over there and let him tell daddy, let him tell the brothers. <coughs> You know what Abraham said? No, <laughs> no, we don't do that. You know why? Because they got everything they need to get saved. They got the Word of God, and they got a preacher to preach it. That's everything they need, son. But they begging to somebody get to them. You know what I want to do for invitation right now? I want to ask the question. The rich man had five brothers going to hell. How many you got? How many family members you got going to hell? How many, how many family members do you have? How many loved ones, people that you absolutely love and would do anything for that aren't going to get to go to heaven? They're going to spend eternity in the place that Jesus unfolded for us today. How many people, how many people you got? What about your brothers and your sisters? What about your mama and your daddy? What about your sons and your daughters? What about your grandbabies? What about your nieces and your nephews? Hey, how about how many co-workers do you know that's going to hell? You say, well, pastor, I mean, it's not up for us to judge. <laughs> Fooey on that. The Bible says that when we're saved, we bear fruit. If you won't know whether they're saved or not, truly, authentically saved, look at the fruit of their life. I'm not saying that we don't have mess-ups and we don't go through spots, but I want, you can know. And as a matter of fact, if you really want to know, why don't you ask Jesus and I promise you he'll tell you. You don't have to guess and wonder. You know what I'm so tired of hearing when, I, when somebody calls me and says, Pastor, pray for our family, such and such, my nephew or my uncle or my brother just died. And the first thing I asked him, because I'm a preacher, I said, well, were they saved? And here's what I hear, 99% of the time. Well, I don't know. Well, I sure hope so. You know what nephew's doing down in hell? Begging somebody that you'd get spurred on to tell mom and daddy about the gospel. But here's what I want to do. 
Because here's the reality. Every single one of us got lost people in our life. And even, I mean, people we know, people we love, even people we don't know. Would you wish hell on your worst enemy? Is this really what you want? This is going to put a new spin when you look at somebody with that slang terminology and tell them to go to hell. You better be careful. You better know and understand what you're wishing on their life. If you're a child of God, you wouldn't want anybody to go to hell. And if you're not a child of God, there's no way in this place today that you would wish that upon yourself. So here's what we're going to do in the invitation. I want to make it very clear. I don't want any confusion. I want you to stand to your feet today. I want nobody to leave this auditorium. There is nothing more important than what we're doing right now. I'm asking that nobody move. Don't go to the back door. Don't go to the side door. Don't move. When I began preach today, the ushers gave you a three by five card, and here's what I want you to do today. Guest, member, it doesn't matter if you're in this place, this is what I want you to do. You know somebody. And God has already laid somebody on your heart that you know needs Jesus Christ. And I want you to write their name down on that three by five card today, okay? And here's what we're going to do, the invitation. Now, here, here's the bottom line. The invitation today is not for you. If you came and said, boy, today's the day I'm going to join the church, I'm telling you, no, you're not today. You can't join the church today. We're closed. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what. Put that number up here. Here's what I'm going to do. I'll make a deal with you. Put that number up there. All right? If you want to join the church today, you can't do it in the invitation. I'm the only preacher in America ever do this. But you can't do it in the invitation day. Here's what you're going to do. I want you to write that number down, right? Write it down. Get it out. Put it in your phone. Ain't nobody going to think anything about it. As a matter of fact, if you get out and start writing it down right now, I mean, they're going to be proud of you because they know you're going to make a spiritual decision today. But it ain't going to be public. You can't come down here. And guess what? We're going to call you in the afternoon, all right? And we'll let you join by phone. Some of you think, boy, that's a good idea. I ain't got to walk in front of all them people. I mean, I'm telling you, it's here. But do, write that down. But you can't come join the church. This invitation is not for you today. Some of you have been saved and they've been baptized. And you're thinking, boy, I got to get this thing right because I ain't going there. All right, guess what? You can't get baptized today. You can't. Maybe this afternoon we'll call you and... I mean, that thing's hot and ready like little seizures. I mean, we'll come up here and get you dumped. But you know, I'm going to do it this morning. All right? The only decisions we're making today is a decision to pray for our loved ones. And then look, here's, what, here's what's going to happen. Two weeks from today, next week's Mother's Day. I'm not going to do this on Mother's Day. We're going to honor the mamas and do baby dedications. You got 14 days to get those people in church. And you're going to ask the Lord for unique and creative ways to get them exposed. You say, well, well, such and such lives in Canada. He's not going to come down here to Springfield. We're on worldwide. Thanks to Al Gore and the Internet. <laughs> we're worldwide. Here's what we're going to do. I want you to get serious about this. We're going to write these names down, and you're going to put them before the Lord, and you're going to commit to the Lord that you're going to do everything you can to get, the, get them exposed to the gospel and the fact of their future with a relationship with Jesus. But that's all we're going to do in the invitation. Now, here's the deal. Right here, Brother Drake, uh, somebody, and Dr. Parker are going to be standing right there, whatever, however y'all work that out, right? But on the end of this side, there'll be nobody in the center. You know why? Because this thing will be wide open because I'm going to ask you in just a minute to bring those cards and lay them at the feet of Jesus, figuratively at the altar. So I don't want nothing clogged up here. And you're going to stop and pray for them, and that's fine. The people coming behind you, they may just throw it over your head. It's fine. I'm being serious. Get that to the feet of Jesus, and don't let nothing stop you. But we're going to come, pray for that. But here's the deal. If you're here today and your name's on that card, you better grab these men by the hand and say, I don't want to go to hell. I want what Jesus is offering through the preacher. 
Today is your day for salvation. That's the only decision you're allowed to make. Don't come down here for church membership. Don't come down here for any other. Don't, hey, listen, I love you. Today, we will pray for you this afternoon. Don't come down here and ask these preachers if they'll pray with you today. You get down here earnest and honest before the Lord and get these names before him. I want everyone in here to participate. You say, well, it's my first time. Come on, join the family. Just get in on praying for this kingdom endeavor. Today, our focus is getting folks who don't know Jesus exposed to the gospel. That's our quest this morning. Father, we love you and thank you. All of these names in advance, we ask for your mercy and grace, wisdom and provision to get these names before you and get these folks exposed to the gospel. Bless their efforts this morning, Father. And Jesus, if be anyone in here never been saved, now their name's on the card. They had to write their own name down. Let them come see Dr. Parker. Anybody on the left side and anybody on the right side, come see Brother Drake or vice versa, whatever. Just don't let them leave without being saved in Jesus' name. Amen.